what do you do, who for, and why? So what, what do you do? I hope people make manage and master cash flow. So, so cash isn't king? No, cash flow is. Do you want to, can you explain that? Yeah, so. To uh, someone who's really crap with money like me. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, you're gonna have ex experienced and seen like, it's becoming more and more difficult to deal with cash. Um, and ultimately, um, cash is one thing, so having it um, you know, and doing what you're going to do with it, but ultimately it's the cash flow. Is how, how can you get yourself in a position where you've got consistent cash flow coming in um, so that you don't have to constantly worry about what's happening this week or this month? And, and you can start building you know, and, and you've got some predictability in your life that you can essentially be the best version of yourself and not be distracted by money problems, which affects relationships. Nice. So what do you do? Brilliant. Who for? Who do you target specifically? Who do you help specifically? Yeah, great question. We predominantly work with trades and construction business owners. Um, and the reason for that is because many years ago, um, I came from an insolvency background. So I worked in the industry that helped people deal with liquidations and bankruptcies. And um, not many people know this, but over the last 30 years, um, the, the biggest um, suffering industry is the trades and construction. So one in four businesses that's gone bust in England and Wales in the last 30 years is trades and construction property related. And naturally end up spending more time with those guys. And do you help other businesses like thinking about yeah. like pubs closing and everything like that? Because you mentioned something about de-niching when I saw you on stage a while ago. Yeah. Is that something you still do or is it very much trades people? Yeah, so we're we're probably like early stage of that. I mean over the years I've I've helped with I've helped loads of different businesses, different industries, graphic designers, web designers, um, accountants, solicitors. Um, then we just we just niched um, because we enjoy that industry, we enjoy the working with those people. Uh, it's technically data wise there's a lot more people that that need what we do but over the years you know we've been fortunate enough to speak on different stages and get to know people and and we constantly get people saying oh well, i know you help those guys but can you help us as well nice. um, so now the answer is yes <laughs> so how many people do you think you've helped over the years um it's an interesting question because it's going to sound a little bit strange me saying it um we've worked with hundreds of clients over the years wow. um but there'll be thousands if not tens of thousands that have got to implement something that they've seen on stage or from an Instagram post or LinkedIn or Facebook or something that someone else has learned from us that's then shared it with them as well. Um, so I, I don't know, but you know, the, the goal is to, to help as many people as possible. Um, just have a better quality of life and not worry about money all the time. Nice. So, I mean, uh, we're big Simon Sinek fans here. So everything we do here, start with why, what's the outcome? Why do you want to do this? So, so why, why do you do what you do? So you mentioned, you mentioned relationships and stress already a couple of times, but what is your main why for, for doing this? Yeah. So, uh, firstly, I'm a big uh, Simon Sinek fan as well. Um, secondly, um, do you try and get tickets? Him and Stephen Bartlett on stage, but they just they just went within seconds. When's that? I didn't even know. Um, I th is it September? I think it's somewhere at the Royal Albert. No, it's somewhere on the South Bank. Only two thousand three hundred tickets, um, and just yeah, you know, straight away. even Stephen Bartlett couldn't get tickets for his mates. He was held in the queue. Um, so those two on stage. So hopefully, on the back of that success, they'll do more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, they probably will once they see the commercial viability. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, um, I'm a big fan of Simon Sinek and, and starting with why and. Um, some people that don't know me well enough think you know it's money related it's more you know superficial stuff it's, it's actually not that at all it's the opposite um on the 27th of uh, july 2006 i for the first time in my life experienced someone commit suicide because of money problems and it just changed the way i saw everything and i thought um you know you grow up and you you hear about stories or you see it in films or tv programs about people committing suicide and and the reasons behind it, and it, it could be some sort of trauma related to relationships or some sort of abuse where it's mental, physical, sexual. Um, I never I never thought in my wildest dreams that people would commit suicide because of money problems. So when I experienced that, I was like, Jesus fucking Christ, like this is... So not that 2006. 2006. 2006. Not that there's ever a good time or a good reason to commit suicide, but for God's sake, not around money. Um, and I just felt like there was a lot of information that people didn't know that was available to them. You know, and the things that people are worried about, you know, if, if you get to a place where you're, you you owe money to certain people or to certain institutions or companies, like oftentimes in many situations, we think the worst. And <clears throat> I just want to start sharing information around this is what a bailiff actually can do when they turn up at your house. And this is what you can do to avoid that situation or to deal with it if it happens. Here's what the, the timeline, <clears throat> excuse me, that a court has to follow before right. you have to turn, like, you know, so all the things that if, you know, if we had a conversation and I said like, well, what are your biggest fears around money? And let's just say the house getting repossessed. Okay, cool. Let's just break that down. There's a process. It's not gonna happen in 10 minutes or two days. 
um, and just giving people that, that information just to alleviate the immediate anxiety and then you can put a, an action plan together. But when I experienced someone commit suicide because of money, it just fucking shook my world. And so, so 2006, a while ago now, so was your experience and knowledge of money good back then? Is it something you've always been interested in? Were you secure at that point? Or did that sort of make you think, shit, I need to get a better handle on this myself because maybe my cash flow isn't where it needs to be? Was that the start of the journey or was that really what drove it forward? Yeah, so um, I think, to, I've never been asked that question before actually. It was the start of this part of the journey. So I've... I would, I would say on some level, so if, if we're going back to like, you know, where it all started, I've always been interested in money as a kid. I've always been interested in what, not the money <clears throat> side of things, but what money can do, like the doors it can open, the things you can do, the, the things you can buy and for, for who and, and the kind of quality of life you can give people around you. Even as a kid, I established that and, and I was attracted to it. And, you know, obviously you grow up with different um, opportunities to earn money, whether, you know, some, uh, some <laughs> okay. legal, some not. Right, okay. um, and so I've always been interested in money um, and I've always been fairly good with money. I've always been fairly good with maths and things like that. Uh, maths that interested me, not the stuff that I that we learned at school. Um, but in terms of answering your question, the being good with money and being responsible and feeling like there's stuff to be shared in this space and there's there's work to be done in this space, like it, it happened then. Oh, yeah. And obviously you, you talked about your peers and when you were younger, interested in money and stuff. Um, a lot of us, I guess, maybe struggle with money mindset habits. We think about, you know, our parents, um, my my mum, quite religious, and she'd say things like, like money's the root of all evil and all this. And you think that kind of stuff must must get lodged here somewhere. So do you think like the responsibility that, that parents, grandparents, teachers have when it comes to money? Because money's not really talked about at school, is it? Yeah, no, it's not. Um, this is such a, a, a an interesting topic and a massive subject, and I look, let's just start off with um, benefit of the doubt. Like all of our parents, God bless them, they've done the best mm -hmm. that they they could and and did and still do with the information that they have or had, and so I think that's that's a good starting point. And so they're not in a position to teach us something that they don't know, and um, and it's interesting you say that about parents because. Uh, my dad is my first mentor, um, as someone that I always looked up to, someone I want to spend more time with, and someone that I always learn from and continue to um, thirst to learn from. He's, he, my dad's an academic, um, I'm not uh, an academic by nature. So um, he's always, he's, he, he was my first mentor. You get to a place in, in life, for me, it was I, I was about on the cusp of about 17, 18, when I realised actually oh, my parents are human and they make mistakes. Um, and I guess it's that transition into adulthood where you think, well, they don't always know best. Uh, they do the best they can mm -hmm. with with what with what they've got, and so well, I, I say that in terms of my dad being my first mentor to be able to say this because my dad has that mindset that you just touched on. Um, not necessarily saying things like the money is the root of all evil, but everything was always about oh, like how much is that, or why are you taking on so much more risk? Why do you need a, an office in a trading centre that's two thousand seven hundred square feet? Why do you need so many members of staff? Why do you need to, you know? fly to Belfast to speak at an event, like what, you know, um, all these different things, it's all cautious, cautious, cautious. The irony is, is that when I speak to my dad and, and, and he'll say um, things like that, on the flip side to that, he'll say, I wish I had more balls and I bought more property. Right. Okay. You know, because he bought um, the house that we lived in, um, heavily mortgaged, and then um, kind of like, partly on purpose, partly by accident, fell into buying a couple of investment properties and couldn't sleep like for weeks and months because of the anxiety of having three mortgages even though the other two properties had tenants and they're yeah. paying the mortgage and so whilst he has all of that baggage that he naturally transfers over to us if we let him as his children the flip side of that is says that's one of his biggest regrets not buying more I could have bought five or ten or fifty and so I think we've got to be mindful that whilst we all have uh, an upbringing and we're surrounded by certain lessons um, let's give all the people around us that we love and that, that they love us the benefit of the doubt and say they did the best for us with the information they had. At some point, you've got to take responsibility and say, well, yes, I was raised in that environment with those lessons, but I've got to take responsibility and say, well, I can't live my life always falling back on, well, my money mindset is on the floor and what chance did I have based on the yeah. people and the information? Like, you've got to take responsibility. Absolutely. Absolutely. And schools... Do you think they they could do more, or is just it, that's not their responsibility? Uh, hundred percent, they could do more, and I do believe that it is their responsibility. Whether they feel it's their responsibility, um, 
it is a different matter. Um, our, our daughters both, I've got a seven, we have a seven year old and a four year old um, and another one on the way. Um, hey, you know yeah. that? Oh, congratulations. Yeah. It, yeah, it's a really big deal actually. I, like, wow. When, when we had the conversation about me speaking at Expert Empires on, in September last year, um, the day before my, my wife had a miscarriage. And so like there was so much going on and, and I literally, like 22 minutes before coming on stage, um, I wasn't gonna turn up and I, I literally got there 22 minutes before going on stage. I've never done that before. Um, and it just put me in a certain state where I just thought, you know what, I'm gonna give the, these guys everything in this slot but if nobody likes it, I actually don't give a fuck. And so, um, just because of where my head was at, so it's such a big deal now, especially for my wife, because I can't, I know we've gone a bit, a bit off tangent, but cool. I can't I can't imagine what a woman goes through um, physically and emotionally, mm. um, if everything even goes well, let alone if something doesn't. Um, and so she, it took her about three months to feel like herself again, um, and she's pregnant again. We've gone past the three and a half uh, month mark. Fantastic. Uh, which is great. Um, but uh, what was the original question? Um, uh, to do with the teachers and responsibility. Because mm. I've got two daughters myself and I do nowhere near your level of knowledge, but the thought of them growing up and, and, and being in debt, because I've been in debt in the past as well, and knowing how much you've got to pay your credit card company or whatever, and I don't want them to get to that position. Or if they do, I don't want them to feel like they're on their own. Um, and I accept that that would be my responsibility as a parent. But maybe some of the teachings at school do more support when it comes yeah. to real life. Like you mentioned maths and stuff. The maths I did at school had nothing to do with money, yeah. ever, yeah. ever. Yeah, and, that, and that's, a, that's a really good, easy one. Uh, and I'm in the same boat, I've, I've been in debt and um, I I made sense of the debt because of how I was feeling at the time. So I came out of a bad relationship and I was just buying loads of stuff mm. and things that just made me feel better short term. Um, and no one, even at that point, even with my thirst for, um, money and financial education. I still knew I was doing wrong, but still did it anyway. Um, in terms of responsibility for schools, I think 100% you hit the nail on the head. I think I, I genuinely believe that it is their responsibility that they could do more, should do more. I don't know whether it's in their agenda or if it ever will be, I don't know. Um, our kids were in private school, which is, it was weird for me because I'm not a private school kind of person. Um, but the great thing about that is that there's flexibility. And so the reason I'm saying that is because I, I speak to the headmaster of the school and the head of um, the lower school where both our girls are uh, being seven and four years old and and there's there's flexibility and opportunity um, for the kids to learn stuff that isn't in the, the normal curriculum in the normal syllabus and, and I've been invited to go and, and speak to these guys at different ages um, just to talk about basic stuff um, and you've just touched on maths as well like you know it, it it's good to get a grasp of mathematics and you can apply that to your own circumstances in life and, and business and career and whatever but it wouldn't it I genuinely believe that if they used money as the examples in mathematics exercises they could still get the point across but now people have got some actual information some data some education that they can go out and be um, a better version of themselves and not fall into debt and not fall like they're they're falling behind in life or that they're reliant on the system or their whatever job or business they create or or, or do in life they're only going to be feeding yeah. the you know the repayments and never getting anywhere so i mean with, with two doors i mean lots of people listening will have young children what are the kind of first things you think you should be teaching your kids about managing money yeah great question so um i think a good healthy understanding um definitely not throwing it in their face you know i go to work and i do this so that you can have that i don't <laughs> definitely not that uh, but more case of uh, you know, so so like you know, when I kiss my girls goodbye, so I'm going to Birmingham. So, well, I'm in Birmingham uh, for mastermind meetings. I've got you know a few clients in the Midlands. I'm probably in Birmingham once, sometimes twice a month. And so when I say oh, I'm 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 going away uh, for a day or a couple of days this week, and they're like, oh, Birmingham, they understand that while I'm away, I'm there to um, okay, not the intricacies of what's going on in the business. They don't know and don't need to know, but they know that I'm out there doing what I do for them. You know, when I say, you know, you know when we go on holiday and you have that ice cream, that's your favourite flavour, and we go to the Lunar Park, which is what the, they call in Cyprus fun, fun fairs, when we go there and, and you've got a certain amount of money to go on the rides, like, all of that comes from me going to Birmingham or me going to the office or me speaking on stage or me doing all these things so that we can have this life and we can spend time together. And so just getting them to understand that, I think, is a good point, okay. firstly, um, of where the money comes from. And then the next part of that is... Um, and again, like I'm not sitting here, definitely not saying that I'm sitting here 
on a pedestal preaching because my wife and I are often having this conversation about, hold on, are we actually spoiling these kids? Or no, what? I just say no to my daughters, which is a problem in itself. <laughs> and, I, and I don't know how to explain the value of money without, like you mentioned, going down the, I work this hard so you can have that kind of route. Um, but yeah, my girls pretty much know, mum says no, they'll go and ask dad. And now they pretty much just come to me first and I do struggle to think, well, no, because that costs 100 quid, that costs whatever it might be. Yeah, uh, mate, this is- So like, any advice there, so I'm personally asking. Yeah, so <laughs> what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm about to say now is actually not just for you, it's for my benefit as a reminder right. as well, because I'm still in this middle ground of, of like, I want to give them everything. Um, and so I heard something which might help you and it's definitely helped me is, um, don't give your children what you didn't have teach your children what you didn't know. Right, and so now, well, right. Write that one down, guys. Right, and so now, well, right. Write that one down, guys. Yeah, so don't don't give them what you didn't have growing up, but teach them what you didn't know growing up. And so, you know, I've got certain, I mean, the car out there, like, uh, uh, as great as it is, I've wanted that car for 35 years. The reason I wanted that car is because the first time I saw that car was 1986, I was five years old, and I don't look it, I was, uh, as in 41 now. Um, first time I saw that car, it was um, it was a kid's car. Um, you know the kind of ones that you buy for like two, three, four hundred quid now from um, like these toy shops where they're battery powered and it, you can buy a Lamborghini or a BMW or whatever. It was one of them, but you put petrol in it. And it was 1986. It was a, a model like for kids, red Porsche 911, and you fucking put petrol in it. Uh, it wasn't battery powered and it was two grand in 1986, okay. right? And so every Saturday our treat was walking from our house up the road uh, in Harringay, up to Wood Green in North London, and just walking around the shops, never buying anything, but that was our Saturday treat. Um, me and my mum, my mum's best mate, and her son, who was my best mate. And we used to walk past this car parts shop, and in the window was this was this car. And every Saturday, I'd, say, I'd stop there, and like my mum would have to wait for me to look at it for a few minutes, and I'd say, like, oh, like, can I have that on my next birthday? And the answer was always no. As it fucking should have been, by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not trying to say that, like, it, you know. But that stuck with me. Were your parents into cars? No. Okay. No, and still aren't. What do they think you bought? Oh, they love it because I love it. Excellent. Um, and they, you know, from a point of achievement. But I mean, if you, re I mean, if I wasn't here and you asked my dad, it would be like fucking biggest waste of money. Um, <laughs> but the the thing is, that I never liked being told no, and that's nothing against mm -hmm. my mum or my parents. But it was the first experience that I had that I can remember as if it was yesterday, where someone said, "No, you can't have that," mm -hmm. and I didn't like it. I didn't, um, there's no blame. Like I should never have got that car. I wouldn't give, do that you know, for, for, for our daughters. But the point is that there was something that was triggered then and that was the trigger. And so, you know, I've wanted that car for 35 years, not just because I like the car and the model and you know, the way it drives and blah, blah, blah. It, it's for me, it's a sentimental nostalgic thing, which is that for me is essentially confirming to myself that I can do what I want within reason. Um, you did an excellent video about it because because we know there are some people out there that don't like using the word triggered but they see people doing well and it just maybe reminds them of something they haven't yeah. accomplished yet yeah. or, or, or ever will yeah. and um, that sort of leads on really I mean with things like the car um, the success you've got like say you, you got like 12,000 Instagram followers do you attract criticism because I know Paul Mortz we both know says criticism is, is the price you pay for success yeah um I mean, do you do you see, do you get any of that? Do you see a lot of that with your clients as as, as they get better on the road? Um, any criticism from clients or from others? Uh, from others criticizing their success. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. It's um, I do very few and far between um, these days. When I say these days, probably the last three or four years. When I first started posting, um, I like my journey started probably about eight years ago, maybe a bit longer now. Um, where at the time I was putting videos up on YouTube and Facebook. And it was essentially, there was nothing to sell. I had no business off the back end. There was no one-to-one -one coaching or consultancy or mastermind programs or me speaking or anything like that. It was just a case of, I've still got one, I'm still involved in the insolvency industry. And I just, I, I dealt with um, a few hundred, sometimes like in the low thousands, number of companies a year that went bust. And what I also did every step of the way was I'd made I'd had conversations with the directors and say, look, like we've had conversations about why you think this business went bust. Like, let's be honest, like what other reasons are there? Like what else was it? It wasn't just that person didn't pay and then you couldn't pay these guys and you know, what else? And so I built up loads of notes. And so I started putting videos out just saying, look, these are the reasons that businesses go bust. And so 
if you just did the opposite of that, um, then you've got a good foundation to be successful, whatever your definition of success is. Mm -hmm. But numbers don't lie, and so we can all agree on some level what success looks like numerically yeah. um, because you're making more than you're spending you know, as you're running, growing a business. And so I started putting that content out. And, and so them days, I used to get like so many fucking messages, and it wasn't even like on the comment thread. People would actually go as far as pressing a few more buttons to then message me on Messenger and say, I've just seen your video, you're a dick, there's nothing about you that oozes success, like, I don't know why the fuck you think that, like, you, you've got any advice to give, you know, and I started posting these videos out, um, the first time I did it, I was wearing a basketball top, Cleveland Cavaliers, LeBron James top, on a beach in Cyprus, and the reason I did that, um, was a, a slightly different story, in, in the sense of, I would started working with a guy called Andy Harrington, okay, uh, public speaking coach, yep. Um, he was my first proper um, insight into this world. And um, so I worked with him in January 2015. And within a, like a month or two, I had a, a five-step strategy that he gave me to um, start building um, my my speaking career. Because I heard him speak, and he basically said that you can attract the people that you can help the most at the time that you can help them the most from speaking on stage. And I did nothing with it for five months until the end of June uh, 2015 when our mum was diagnosed with myeloma blood cancer and the very next day um, I thought I, I've got to just stop putting things off because I don't know how long any of us have got and, and I need to get a message out because people are committing suicide and, and having problems and, and falling into depression and getting divorced because of money problems I've got some information that might help them I need to get it out and that's when I started posting the videos and that's when I started getting loads of comments and uh, and, and people like DMing me, so it was just, it was relentless, you know, for, for a while, for about three months, um, of just people just like going out of their way to basically say like, fuck off the internet, you're a dickhead, like just, like, yeah, and I just thought, fucking hell, the, like, normal circumstances, it would have been enough for me to come off social media, but I just kept thinking, look, like, behind that lens, there's one person that, that might, I don't know, but might need to hear what I've got to say today, and that might be the one thing that makes them think, you know what? Today's not the day. Today's not the day that I'm gonna kill myself because there is hope and I'm worried about a bailiff or I'm worried about my house being repossessed or I'm worried about this and actually George has just given me some information that what I thought was the case might not be the case. And so my worst fears won't be realised. And so that you know, that was the thing that got me through it. And like I said, you know, that was in the early days. You know, touch what I probably jinx it now, probably gonna get loads of fucking hate crime now. Hate crime, hate hate uh, messages now. Um, but I don't deal with it as often now, but I'm, a, I'm in a much better place to deal with it. You know, I'm not sitting here saying I'm Superman. Like, you know, I probably want people to like me more than mm -hmm. the average person wants people to like them. Um, I did a video about this recently. Uh, one of our videos has gone viral, only one. I'm not fucking, you know, saying that, that all of them do, just one. Uh, I think we're at about 918,000 views um, on a reel and, um, and there's been well over 300 comments. And one night, I spent one night like reading them all mm. and, and whatever, and, and I didn't want to because I, I was worried that it was gonna really fucking affect me negatively. Yeah. Um, 80, 80, 80, 90, maybe even 95 percent of those 300 plus comments were negative. Who's this dickhead? Like, like you know, just nice. stupid advice. There was a few, you know, positive comments. But I thought not a single person out of these 300 plus comments is a client, is a follower. Um, that's connected with us is um, a friend, a family member, a colleague, you know, in any way, shape or form. Nobody actually knows me. So it's different if there's people that know me and they know what I'm about and they're putting, you know, criticizing me or, or whatever and that would be, that's a different situation. But no one knows me, no one knows what I've done, what I haven't done, no one knows why I do it, no one knows who I'm doing it for. Yeah. And so, you know, for me, there's another um, saying, I, I don't know where I first heard this and you've probably heard this before but in different variants of it, but you can't give so much um, merit and so much value and so much um, opportunity to someone um, to make you feel good or bad about what you're doing. And that person is in the stands commenting and criticising, doesn't have the balls to get mm -hmm. in the ring. Mm -hmm. And so I can't give any, every, every person I come across or that might see me on social media like so much value in my life that I'm like, well, you know, if this person th thinks I'm a dick and says I'm a dick, then that must be true and therefore I shouldn't be on social media. So. I think you've you've got to be careful. Make make sure that if you're going to be putting putting yourself out there, and I think everyone should on some level, um, whatever you're comfortable with, 
you've got to be prepared for the other side. And you know, I'm, I'm friends and, and follow Paul Mort as well, and I love his advice on this and, and lots of other people that it's just like, you can't be successful unless you have these yeah. critics, these comments, these this negativity. And let's be honest, like why the fuck should you expect to be successful and not have yeah. these things? Like, you know, I, I look at the things and say to myself as a content reminder, God willing, we've got lots of kids and lots of grandkids and I live to, to see all of that and experience that. And I've got this picture in my head where you know, the whole family, grandkids and, you know, God willing, great grandkids, we're all sitting around the fire and it's it's Christmas. And and one of them turns around to me and says, you know, what advice could you give us about starting, growing a, a business and what lessons have you learned? And I don't want to fucking say to them, you know what, I had this idea, I started a business and it worked pretty well. I want to say I started a business, I got punched in the face a few times, here's some examples like came close to quitting a few times, you know, struggled with this, couldn't sleep when, I, when that happened, like, you know, didn't know how I was gonna navigate through that situation. I had no fucking idea how I got here, you know, going through all of those struggles. But, like, you can't have the, 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 the success and the view from the top of the mountain without the struggle and the blood, sweat and tears and years of climbing the fucking mountain. You know, and you don't even appreciate it if it comes too easy. So I don't wanna be the guy that says, Actually, we had this idea, and it fucking worked really well. And I'm kind of like looking over my shoulder, thinking like, like I'm waiting for someone to tap and say, "Actually, that success that we're taking it away from you, you know, you didn't earn it." Like you don't really, I don't believe, truly value the things that come too easy anyway. So yeah, that's that's. I think it was um, I don't know if it was Lisa Johnson. Someone someone said at a conference recently that if you let a troll, for want of a better word, put you off from doing what you're doing, which is serving people to the best of your ability. You're essentially putting a stranger ahead of your own family. 100%. And that's just like always, and, and, and that's a struggle that our clients have, that the more visible we market them, the more far they may come under from a small section of the community. But it's almost like when you seek advice from people, not everyone's been in the ring, not everyone's qualified to give you advice. So when you post something on social media saying, oh, what do you think of my first video or whatever? Well, are those people qualified to give you honest advice? So most people, you know, maybe it's a client, maybe it's a close friend, maybe it's a successful business person. But apart from those kind of three groups of people, there's a lot of people out there who just give you unqualified advice that yeah. you shouldn't be listening to. Yeah, and I everyone's agree. an expert with other people's businesses, right? Yeah, 100%. And also, you mentioned sitting around the fire with your kids, your grandkids, and they talk to you about business. So sort of nice segue onto um, what are the kind of top tips you'd give to people when starting up a business? Yeah, I mean, this could go in so many different ways. I think um, I'm a big fan of uh, a question that uh, I shared this at the mastermind that I'm part of yeah, uh, two days ago. Um, and, and on some level, it blew people away, not because I'm so great, but they've never heard it in this way. And I just thought, these conversations happen often. And so my thinking is, look, before you get into um, starting a business, tips, all that kind of stuff, like just let's just pause that and just go a step before that and just think, look, what do you want out of life? I think that should be the first question. Um, what, what, how do you want to feel like as often as possible? You know, what makes you happy? What makes you feel like you're contributing? What makes you feel like you're successful? Like what, what, what are those metrics? How would you measure that? Um, what makes you feel comfortable with, uh, you know, a certain amount of money in the bank or what makes you feel like you've got security or you've got options in life or that you're growing or that you're, you know, you're contributing to people around you. So I think like, firstly, what kind of life do you want? Then we then go to, well, what, what business is going to be able to facilitate that life and support it and encourage it? And then it becomes a case of, like, you know, like passion, you know, for me is important. Um, I, I don't do anything just for the sake of making money. Um, and so then when, when you've got all of that, I think, you know, the actual, to answer your question in terms of business, like you've got to just understand the numbers and, and what's most important because numbers don't lie. You know, all the other stuff, like... Um, when it comes to why I'm obsessed with cash flow is because it presupposes you've had clients and you've been paid. And for you to have clients and be paid, it presupposes you've had got some form of a sales process. And that presupposes you've done some marketing and generate some inquiries. And so it presupposes all of that, but you need to know your numbers. You know, first and foremost, like what are the absolute non-negotiable like running costs that you need? Not the things that would be nice, not the, you know, we were just having a conversation about your amazing office here. 
like when you started, like when I started, you didn't need all of this stuff. Yeah, so it looked like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so what do you need to provide the service? Mm -hmm. um, and then making sure that you've got that covered so you know that's the break even point and that you know that wherever you're charging over and above that is a profit. Um, and obviously, you know, you, you've got cost of sales and like things that you need to spend money on for providing that service or that product. And then you've got operating costs, running costs, all kinds of overheads just to, you know, whether you guys have got one client, a hundred clients, a thousand clients, the rent of this office stays the same. Mm -hmm. And so just understanding the difference between those. So numbers don't lie. We can go in, into that in, in a lot more detail in terms of um, what numbers you need to know. I think it's, it's good for you to know, you know, how much you're turning over. Mm -hmm. Um, your profit margins, your running costs, um, you know, making sure that you know at some point when you reach the VAT threshold at 85 grand that you know what you're doing with that and you're putting that 20% into a separate account because it's not your money. Um, knowing what your profit margins are, having a separate profit account, putting that money in there, you know, and, and the reason for that is number one, you're structured, you're organized. Number two, like, we all have bad days in business, bad moments, etc. And there's there's times where you think fucking you know what's it all for? Is it fucking worth it? I, I don't even, I don't know if it is, but given the stress and whatever, when you look over here into the profit account, and you can see that building. Um, it makes you feel like you know what it is worth it. Yeah. I am I am making a difference, and then you can choose what you want to do with that money. You can either leave that money in reserves that gives you and your 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 business and your business partner and your team confidence to go out to the marketplace and make the next move. You could reinvest it you know, to take the business to the next level. And whilst, you know, the pool table and, and the aesthetics of this office looks amazing, like someone could turn around and say, well, you don't need that. That's the tangible bit. The intangibles are, well, you've created a great environment. I don't know this, I haven't tested it. You might have, productivity might be significantly better. Mm -hmm. Everyone feels better. You know, there's a, a happiness score involved yep. in, in working here. Um, people like me come here, we're impressed. Are we more likely or less likely to recommend you to other people that we come across? Like, there's a lot of yeah. excuse me intangibles with that as well. And so, just being clear on the numbers and, and only doing what you need to do in terms of what you need to spend. Make sure you're making a profit, um, because there's no point building a business that number one isn't profitable, but even more importantly, building a business that doesn't make you happy in life. Yeah. And that's why I start with that first question, which is we can all build businesses, and then we get to a place where we're like fuck, like. This isn't what I thought it was going to be. This isn't what I wanted. So if you're if your daughters, you know, we talk about Ica guys sometimes, you know, that perfect marriage of doing something you love that the world needs, that you get paid for, and that you're good at. Those four things, that, yeah. that's a sweet spot. So, you know, what would be the criteria for, 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 you, for you to always like recommend to your daughters? If they sort of had those things pretty much, would you recommend them going to business? What would be the key things you'd like to find out? Like, they'll probably do what they want yeah, anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm smiling because um, my wife and I have this conversation where we both agree. Um, I don't know how you feel about this, but we both agree that, and I've been to university, I've got a degree, and, and it, it's such a, an, on, on many levels, an insignificant part of my journey. Were you, were you like me, the free university time, or did you have to... Uh, uh, so I've got student loans, but... Um, Not the 40 grand that they Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so relatively. Um, it, I just missed the grant part of it, um, but compared to what it is now, yeah, significantly less fees. And so my wife uh, is assisted by profession and she went to university and whatever, but our agreement is that the education system, the school system that we touched on already, the university system isn't the be all and end all like our parents' generation that like, you know, you have to get a degree. It was such a big uh, thing. My, my right. dad would have killed over if I hadn't gone to university. Yeah, it would have been so it, the shame upon the family. Yeah. Terrible, terrible. But, but that's the only reason I went to university was to please my dad, who I oh, absolutely right, love okay. and adore, yeah, too, yeah. who's an academic. I'm not academic. And I like to drink, but yeah. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. And it's great for that. And, you know, I, I went 300 miles away because I was like, oh, I'll go, but I'm going to go fucking as far as possible. I went to Middlesbrough. Oh, wow, right. Which is, yes. I mean... Other end of the you country. Know, say again? Other end of the country. Yeah, yeah completely. completely. You know, had a great fucking time. Did no work, like, mm -hmm. enjoyed myself. You know, one night we'd be out in Newcastle, another one night in Middlesbrough, another night in Leeds, another night in Manchester, just driving around the north of the country. Um, great time. But the point is that my wife and I are like, we're definitely not going to force our girls to um, go to university. And then there was a pause in, uh, in one of our conversations between my wife and I, and she turns around to me and says, you do know that that means you're not going to fucking force them to start a business just because that's what you're into. <laughs> and I was like, fuck, I just like deflated in my seat. 
But again, I can't force them to do any, but let's just say they decide that they want to go into business for themselves. I'm just gonna keep it as simple as this. Find something that you absolutely love and then let's figure out how you make money from it. Let's start there. I want them to be happy um, and then we can figure out how to monetize it. Um, and that, that's that's where I'd start from and then we can obviously go into the intricacies of, of growing and scaling a business from there, but that, that would be the start. So what about when they get to, I don't know, maybe teenage years, so my girls are 15 and 13, have to think about that then. Uh, and they start showing interest in your business. So like my daughter's like, oh, you're asking about copywriting and how Facebook ads work and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, every now and then I think, oh, that'd be nice when they have, you know, like a real family thing, daughters in the business. You know, your daughters, I presume, are sort of interested in, in, in money and how it all works. And are they, are they yet at the stage where they're asking questions about what it's... Because you mentioned, obviously, they know that you're coming to Burnley and doing all this, but they don't know exactly yeah, yeah. what you do and how you help people. Yeah, this is a brilliant question. Um, I've got a massive smile on my face, you can see. Um, so, it, all, all be, well, despite them being seven and four, they do ask questions, but no problem not... Definitely not the kind of questions that your uh, teenage girls are asking. Um, and so it's more a case of, uh, they've, they've come to the office a few times. Okay. You know, they, they uh, my PA uh, has bought them like sweets and like a little carton of juice or whatever, and then they've been running around the office or whatever. But then like I put them to work and one like cleans the windows a little bit and the other one is um, uh, wiping things off the whiteboards and the other one's like cleaning the lunch table that we've got for, in a separate section for our, for our clients and stuff. And so, like, I'm putting them to work, but they can see all of that. Uh, but interestingly, in terms of them getting involved and asking questions, because I'm so into videos and, you know, using video uh, content for social media and whatever, they're often in um, the videos. Uh, and so, naturally, I had a conversation with my wife, make sure that we're all on the same page, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, occasionally she and our daughters... If, if my wife's comfortable with it, you know, I think it's good for us to share as much as we want to share. Um, and so they're in the videos. And interestingly, my se uh, seven-year-old, uh, Katerina, uh, for probably about last year and a half, actually, um, she's, she's, she's very like me. She's, um, but she, she asked me these questions and says, um, that video that you just took, are you going to put that on Instagram? I'm like, yeah. Have you asked me if I, if I mind being on your Instagram? And so she's, like, she's got that kind of like uh, jokey... Okay but she's aware of what's going on around her and they're asking these questions and they understand that they're involved. And I've got them to do like little business tip things and shout out, no confusions, just solutions and stuff, like our little taglines and stuff. It, so I'm, I'm involving them. them. Are they asking you for money? Yeah. How much, how much do I get clean the windows? That's, that's exactly what my two would say. Yeah. So that could be my fault, I don't know. Yeah, so at the moment we're in a phase where they're doing certain chores and they're not always, rarely, uh, but sometimes, they're really getting a monetary reward for it. It's more a case of, um, you get to stay up a little bit later or you get to um, have this, you get to have like an extra play date this week or like something like that um, rather than money. That that will be the next phase. I think, I'm my, sure. I think my kids are around maybe 10, maybe a bit older when I set up the Go Henry accounts for them. Mm. So if you start putting money in little, you know, so they do a, do a chore and put money in, they, yeah. they get their own card. They've got nationwide bank accounts now. Um, but Great I mean, is, is that... Good place to I mean, when it comes to like bank accounts and stuff like that. I know when I saw you on stage, business, you talked about having, you know, these numerous bank accounts yeah. for your profit for your VAT and stuff. I mean, what's what's a good age? Talk a lot about children in this podcast, which is good. Um, mm -hmm. What age would you recommend? And what's a good place to start for in terms of them having almost like their own money? Yeah, and, I and think, will that help teach them the value of money? Yeah, I think um, as early as possible, as early as you feel like they need it. You know, what's going on in their life? I, I have a similar conversation with with people, my wife and, and other parents. Um, about when's the best time to get your child a mobile phone and things like that. And so, you know, if you're in a situation where they don't need a mobile phone because they're never on their own, um, then you delay that. Um, if they're in a situation where they're not, there's no requirement for them to pay for anything themselves or do anything, then you can delay it. Um, I think from uh, teaching them the value of money and, and, and things like the, of that nature, I think if you think the bank account thing is going to help, or whether it's other stuff, like it, the the point is to do something. Um, the thing to do is dependent on what you do. So, for example, um, our eldest is seven; she's too young for a mobile phone and bank account, you know, in our opinion. But what we are doing from a monetary point of view and a cash flow point of view um, is I do um, specific like maths homework with her, um, and so we go through um, the math stuff that she does at school. We've got some additional maths uh, workbooks that my wife bought. 
And then either, if I can, um, I'll put a twist on <clears throat> those exercises okay. and make it more real life and, and I'll, I'll use experiences in their own lives and in our lives so they can actually relate to it straight away. Um, or I'll create some based on the actual exercise and the function of it and what the the ideal conclusion is of that exercise and them learning it, and I'll just try and, uh, you know, make it more relative to, to us. It's interesting because you talk about mobile phones, it came up my Facebook memory the other day. Um, it was, it's a screenshot of a WhatsApp message and said, it's Holly's first WhatsApp message to me, and it's something like, hello, banana pig, and then loads of poo emojis. And I was like, well, that can't be right, because at that year, Holly would have been seven. And I was almost like, shit, I gave, must have given her a mobile phone when she was seven. And so you mentioned Katerina there. Did the many of her semi-old friends have mobiles? Because I thought, that's way too young. Why on earth, why on earth they'll do that? Yeah, no, they don't. Um, the, only per the next person that does in her world, uh, so to speak, is my 10-year-old niece, um, who is 10, three years older, um, and just got a mobile phone. Um, and so that's her first exposure to it. And she's now like, oh, when I get a phone, I'm like, yeah, well, it's at least three years away. Um, so... Yeah, I, it's interesting though, because there, there's obviously pros and cons with everything, you know, and, and, you know, even if she did have a mobile phone, whether it's seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 10, 11, um, if I was making the decision right now, it would, it would realistically not be a smartphone, yeah, yeah. you know, it would be, the point of this is to call us if you need us, here's how you do it, rather than um, all the other stuff, and I appreciate there's things like, you know, for people in the know, things like Roblox and all these games that kids are playing, um, or mobile phones, whether it's theirs or their parents' phones. But a lot of these things are on the internet and, like, you know, you can connect with other people and just because it says, the, you know, the, the username of that person says what you think might be a eight-year-old girl, like... Yeah. It's weird, you know, because I see this in business quite a lot. You're keeping up with the Joneses, it's all about the kids, and you, the kids always have that peer pressure that, oh, all the kids in my class have got an Xbox or whatever it might be. But Joel and I often see business owners who, who probably go outside their means because they want to keep up with the Joneses that yeah. other people in their community have got whatever it might be, the flash office or two offices or, and they sort of spend perhaps more than they need to. Um, so, I mean, what are the kind of, the, the people you help, how does it work in terms of the first steps? Do you look at things like, well, you mentioned the tangibles, the intangibles. I'm a tradesman or, or any business owner. I'm interested in working with you, George. What happens? Yeah, so um, we're in a place and have been for a while where we, we get um, a fair few inbound inquiries like that. Been watching okay. your staff, like, you know, wondering how you can help me. The next step would be uh, booking a telephone call um, so we can establish that. You know, and one of the, like, I, I'm, I'm so aligned um, with, uh, and, and I'm in a place where, like, the first conversation I'm having is, okay, well, thanks for the message. Like, what? do you believe you need help with and you know why us and all that kind of stuff and so you know I'm not in the business of just taking people's money for the sake of it because they say or they think that they're interested so the first step is is that and then you know subject to it being a great fit then come to one of our events or book a one-to-one -one business consultation um, because we don't work with people on a 12-month basis unless they would come and spend a day with us at a workshop okay um, or, where are these workshops say again where are these workshops um, a place called Enfield North London okay yeah and so the reason for that is we want to add value to people at every stage. So I want people to um, follow me on Instagram, for example, and get value from the content, even if they never get in touch and we never speak. If they make uh, an inquiry, but it never goes into coming to an event, I want them to have a great experience on that phone call. If they come to a workshop, but then don't move to the next step, I want them to have a great experience on that day. But it also... Um, is an opportunity for them to see how we work, how we function, the kind of experience and results they can expect if they did work with us, mm -hmm. but also the opposite to that as well. Like, we, you know, I don't want to work with people that are not committed. I'd like to say, you're the sort of people that you, you can't help. Yeah, so, I mean, first and foremost, if you're not committed, if you're not going to implement, then I'm not interested. Because it's just, it's a waste of your time and your money. <clears throat> it's a waste of my time and my team's time. And it's going to affect the people in the room as well, you know, that if you were to join a, a mastermind group or, or whatever. And so, like, our most successful clients are the ones that just do two things consistently. That's it. Number one is implement, and number two is ask for help when they need it. That is it. Nice. Have you, over the years then, have you got pretty good at sussing out who can take action and who's yeah. just 
Yeah, 100%. 100%. And there's some people that I swerve and don't even give them the opportunity to come to an event oh, okay. um, because I'm sensing it. There's other times that I can't swerve it and I have to actually say, look, for this reason, <coughs> I don't believe we're a good fit. Um, and and that, that is the final test because if they're like, okay, fine, or they think I'm being arrogant, which is not the case, it, I want to see their fight. Mm -hmm. There's other times where I've been on the phone to people and I'm like, look, I've got to stop you there. I don't think we're a great fit. And, and that makes them like, sit back in their chair and like, well, what do you mean? Why are you saying that? I'm like, look, I think I've got this wrong. I thought that you were committed. I thought that you were a leader. I thought that you were serious about the goals that you had. I thought that you genuinely wanted to give your family the life that you said you wanted to give them. But don't get me wrong, I'm only saying that to the people that I feel yeah. energy-wise need to hear it. Um, and I pretty much know what the reaction is going to be. And that, that makes them stand up and be like, okay. no, I'm the fucking committed one. Okay. I'm the leader. I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm in. Like, I want to pay up front and full. Um, it's not a, a sales tactic. It's a case of like, I want people to prove to me that mm -hmm. that you're you're the real deal that you're going to implement because it's a waste of time for everyone. Yeah. Similar in our game, action. Um, I'd say like, knowledge obviously helps, but 80% of success is that consistency to implement. People usually, oh, I want to dance on TikTok. But then when the phone doesn't start ringing two days later, they get bored and think, right, I'm going to do this on Instagram, I'm going to do email, I'm going to do this. And they just, I don't know what it is, they just don't have the, maybe it's the patience, they don't have the patience to just consistently implement. And also that compound effect, may, maybe it's a social media result that everyone expects results the next day. Yeah. You know, um, I'm a PT, I go to a PT and I want to be like five stone lighter in a week. It doesn't work like that. It's, it's doing something that might be small, but doing it regularly, consistently over time. Um, and maybe some people just aren't in it for the long haul. I don't yeah, know. Just, I've had clients <coughs> who say this, like great clients committed, they implement, etc. And then, you know, one that I've no names mentioned, but like I've got a client in mind that doesn't really have a big social media presence, doesn't do much on it, um, is now taking it more seriously. And like, oh, I've put a post out, like, you know, let's see what happens. Like, I'm really excited to see how many inquiries you get. And I'm like, look, well, stop. I've been posting for eight or nine years. I might have, like the other day, two days ago, I put a story out. There's a few hundred people watched it in the first couple of hours. We've got four inquiries from it. I could post, I could go a whole week of posting three reels a day on Instagram and putting those same reels on, on Facebook and putting those videos on, on LinkedIn, doing stories uh, and not get one mm -hmm. inquiry. So just like, you know, you've got to give it some context and some patience. And I say to people, look, if you're going to do anything like um, focus on your social media, start a YouTube channel, start a podcast, like you've got to go into it thinking, look, it's a good couple of years of grinding with zero expectation. Yeah. Because otherwise, A, you're going to be disappointed, um, and B, you're going to fail, definitely in your eyes. And you know, people keep saying to me, oh, why don't you start a podcast? Because I know I'm self-aware enough that I don't have, I haven't created, it's not a priority for me, I haven't yeah. created the space to do it, because if I'm going to do it, I'm going all in. I'm not going to do it and like, do three episodes and then none for 10 weeks and then do another five. And Look, We see that a lot, yeah. Yeah, but the things that I am committed to, like posting every single day and twice on the day that I don't feel like it for the last nine years, I am committed to that, and so I'm all in. And so, you know, people have got this, you know, and, and the, the client in mind actually is not like a, a young man that you might think they've grown up, you know, with the internet, they've grown up with instant gratification. It's not that, it's like, you know, someone significantly older. Um, so I think we've just got to manage our own expectations um, and, and what we're, we're, we're doing and, and putting things in. But same yeah. with these kind of things. So when it comes to action then, I mean, what are the kind of, I mean, you get a lot of shit done, very successful. What are the sort of non-negotiables that you have in your day or your week? What, what are the things that you regularly know you need to do to move you forward, to move you close to your goals? Yeah, um, I just want to touch on something that you just said there, like I'm very successful. Firstly, thank you for saying that. Um, I appreciate that. I just want to touch on something because if there's someone listening and thinking, well, you know, Andy thinks George is successful or George thinks Andy's successful, um, just to note that those are for our own reasons and that everyone has their own definition of success. Mm -hmm. And so whilst I gracefully accept that compliment, um, I think it's important to note that we all have different definitions of success. Okay. Um, and you know, you might think I'm successful, but then there might be like 10 million other people that think I'm not. Um, and, and the same for anyone else that, that might be listening or, or, or watching. But in terms of my non-negotiables, um, I these whole, this whole like thing about like to-do lists and whatever, I think the first thing to do, and this is just about being self-aware, so what works for you um, is the thing that you, you need to establish. And so for me, the word to-do list doesn't sound fun. 
it sounds like a chore, it sounds shit, mm -hmm. it doesn't sound something that I'm going to get excited about, but a power list, for example, or a success list, mm -hmm. or a to done list, which I heard from a friend of mine, Neil Giller, uh, the other day, like whatever word resonates with you, I think call it that, that's oh, okay. the first thing. Um, the second thing is only have a maximum of, in my opinion, five things on it. You know, whether than this like 37 yeah. fucking point list that never gets done, just goes from 37 to 42 to 57 to 63 to whatever. And it's never ending, because let's be honest, there's always stuff to do as a yeah. business owner. And then um, just focus on getting those things done. And then, um, so for me, uh, I, pl I, I have a default diary. So there's certain things that get done by default, um, hence the name. If it's in the diary, it gets done. If it's not in the diary, it doesn't. And so um, I have a maximum of five things per day, which I pretty much map out on a Sunday, okay. um, as well as other things like what I'm going to wear every single day for the next five days. And I check the weather of where I'm going to be. Just one less thing to think about. And that sounds a little bit over the top. Um, and also like the meetings and things I've got going up just to get myself in that headspace and plan content. But five things a day, which means if I get those five things done by 8 a.m. or 12 p.m., it's up to me whether I want to go on to the next five, the next five points for tomorrow, um, and get ahead of the of the week or or, or tomorrow's um, list, um, and then I just structure my days in a certain way that works best for me. So I'm one hundred percent not a morning person, but I not get the up. Four a.m. club yet, really? No, but I actually I do get up between four and five a.m. Right. Oh wow! I stumble downstairs. Weekends too. More often than not, I have one of the days in the weekends that okay. I just won't put an alarm on. Um, it used to be Saturdays, but now I take my youngest to jiu-jitsu on a Saturday morning, so we can't do that. Um, and so I stumble downstairs, make a coffee, and then there's certain things that I do every single morning religiously. And this okay. is the discipline bit. Um, I reread my vision and my goals. It takes me like a few seconds, if not a couple of minutes, if I want to read it a few times. Okay. Excuse me. Then um, I check in on messages, WhatsApps, um, emails, um, do uh, my social media routine every morning, which takes between 15 and 30 minutes. So that's all done. Um, that then gives me um, the feeling that I've accomplished something already and everyone in my household is still asleep. Um, it, and again, like it's not because, like it's like for any other reason, I heard Jay Alderton uh, articulate this really well uh, the other day on one of his um, Instagram posts about, you know, it's not this like whole, oh, this is how you be successful, you get up for, no. Like, if I don't get up at that time when everyone else in my house is asleep, I will not get an opportunity to do it. Like this is the only time I can do it without distractions. Because when they are awake, I wanna joke about with them and spend a bit of time with them and get them ready for school. And you know, do some exercise and we've had a conversation you know, about health and, and stuff and, and it's something that I'm taking more seriously now. So if I don't get up at that time in the morning to get this stuff done, it ain't gonna get done. But what the other, the other amazing thing for me is, is that once I have that done, it gives me this like, uh, feeling of confidence and, and achievement, mm -hmm. and it's not even like eight or nine a.m. yet. So between five and seven is where I get all this stuff done. And um, and then it just allows me to be completely present and fully focused on what that day brings. So nice. it could be a podcast, it could be running a mastermind day, it could be client meetings, it could be having a team day, um, quarterly planning day, or like whatever it is, phone calls, but I'm fully present mm -hmm. um, for every one of those activities because I know I've done the other stuff every morning mm -hmm. in that morning. And so that works really well for me. And then also the other thing of like, again, like if you're watching this and you're a business owner, like you don't have to respond to every email and every phone call immediately, otherwise the world's gonna fucking end. Like if someone desperately needs you, if someone's lying in a fucking pool of blood, they're not gonna fucking email you. <laughs> so like, you don't have to put this extra pressure on yourself. Like shit, that email came in at 11.05 PM, I've got to respond. Like you manage people's expectations. You choose the way that you run your business. I've got that little slot five to seven in the morning. I'll check in on emails at lunchtime and at the end of the day. I've got slots for phone calls at the beginning and the end of each day because I work with a lot of trades and mm -hmm. typically best time to speak to them is before they go on site in the morning and when they come off after 4 p.m. So like seven to 10 in the morning, four to 6 p.m. in, in, in the afternoon. Um, and then if it's, uh, if it's something I can respond to quickly, I'll do it so it's done or delegate it or to one of my team or delete it. And if it's something that I've got to spend a bit of time on in terms of emails and I'll, I'll do that between the 5 and 7 a.m. slot the next morning. Uh, but it's just having a, a system that works for you. So we can all share what we do, but you've got to find what works for you. Well, that certainly works for me because I attest to that because Joel and I both learned the hard way the danger of responding to emails straight away because mm. one day a client 
sent me a text 10 minutes after she emailed to say, oh, you usually get back to me straight away. But it was my fault, you know, you make a rod for your own back. So that's, yeah. that takes a discipline. Because, I mean, it sort of leads on to what I was going to ask next about how you create a work-life harmony. So, you know, you talk about being present, which is which is brilliant. And it took, I think Holly was about eight when um, I was saying to her, I, I spend a lot of time with you because she didn't think I did. Uh, and I said, no, I, I do spend a lot of time. And she goes, no, you always spend time with me and your phone. And she was eight at the time. And I was like, shit. And that's when I started understanding what, what you'd been talking about, about it's not necessarily about amount of time, it's being present. So if you're with your, your kids, you're with them. I'd rather have one hour just with them than three hours when my phone's going off and all that kind of shit. So have you got any other tips in terms of like, you know, being a business owner, how, how you still uh, be present with those, those people who are important to you? Yeah, I um, when you just mentioned that about the phone and being present, um, like that was just like a little shot in the heart because I, I've experienced literally the exact same thing. You know, our eldest, this is going back about two, two and a half years, just turned around to me and said, why are you always on your phone? So she was, what, five fuck. then? Yeah, yeah. Like, fuck, man. Um, and so, and again, like, you know, this isn't something that I'm proud of, but uh, I, I share this um, as often as possible because if I went through it, then there's a good chance that other dads have gone through it as well or are going through it right now, which is I used to, I used to feel like doing the school run was a chore. Okay. Um, and it was just like a stone in my shoe that I had to do mm -hmm. before I got back to my life and my working day. Um, and it just hit me a, a couple of years ago. And now, um, every Monday morning, um, unless like there's something specific going on, like generally every Monday morning, I'm taking the girls to school, um, I'll pick them up and then also on a Friday morning as well. And that is, it's one of the highlights of my week because I'm not on the phone, I'm holding their hand, we have unbelievable conversations, we might sing a little bit or just listen to what they'd like. It's just, it's just absolutely fucking magical. Um, it's those moments they'll, they'll remember. I'm yeah. sure they'll remember nice holidays. If I think about my, my late father, and even though we had great holidays, the, the times that immediately come to me are the little car journeys, the little meals when, when my brother was in hospital being born and, and so mum was in there as well. Just me and dad sat on the kitchen floor with a big curry pot in the middle. Those little things that don't cost any money, but hard, hard to explain to a kid because sometimes they think, it's all about the flash holidays, but it's these little car trips and stuff like that that one day when you're old, you'll think, shit, those are special times. Yeah, yeah, and, and um, like, just to fucking underpin your point, like they, they remember everything, and here's the example that I can share. It, our four-year-old um, is in reception. So it started last September. This is uh, coming to the end of the first year um, at school. So last year, she so was at nursery. There was one day at nursery where they invited the dads to come in for a dad's breakfast, and I went we were a little bit late and we missed the breakfast oh, right okay. and so just to give you some more context uh, to prove the point there's so many times at nursery and at school where i'd go to certain functions and it would be me as a dad with my wife uh, most of the time but no other dads there and if i'm honest i felt a little bit smug mm. Now, all of those times that I've been to all these nursery events with with our with both kids, but in this case, Andrena, our youngest, who's now four, um, she's going to be five in a couple of months, but she's now four. All those times that I went, all these things that I did, the only fucking thing that she brings up is, she calls me Baba, uh, as a Greek thing, she goes, Baba, do you remember that time that you were late and we missed the dad's breakfast? Like, that's the one fucking yeah. thing that she, so, so just to like, you know, what I think, oh, you know, they're only four, they're only five, mm. they're only seven, they're only 11. Like, how much do they really remember? They remember the things that, that affected them. Like, we made them feel a certain way. And so, um, you know, that, that was like a massive slap in the face for me. It was like, you know, all the things that we could do, they remember that. But it's just about focusing on that. So in terms of being present, um, for me, the first thing that goes into my diary, um, and obviously I did this by myself pre having a, a PA, now my, my PA and I start this process in September uh, and through October, November, December for the following year. Um, we map out my diary. So obviously there's, you know, we know that certain things are happening, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of masterminds, events, if I'm speaking in different places, etc. But the first thing that goes in are six holidays, family holidays. Nice. The first thing that goes in. Now obviously our kids are at school age, so we know when the holidays are and all that kind of thing. So it's easy to navigate. So that's the first thing that goes in. And then everything gets built around that. And then in terms of being present um, of an evening or um, definitely even on holidays, 
And don't get me wrong, when I say six or five days a year, like I'm not sitting there saying like, you know, I'm, I'm throwing money around. Like I'm not saying they're all 20, 30 grand to buy holidays. Like it could be two days in Norfolk mm-hmm. that cost like 158 pounds. That, that's irrelevant. It's the time away, change of scenery and the opportunity to be present. And so even when, when we're on holiday, I still get up at about five o'clock oh, in the okay. morning. I do a few bits um, so, because I don't like, for me personally, I don't like coming back to having things to catch up on yeah quote unquote so I do a few bits um, it just helps me kind of stay like somewhat connected and then it makes me feel like I can not look at my phone for the rest of the day and not even notice and I'm fully present with the kids and my wife Maria and, and whatever and, and then interestingly um, the other benefit to that is Katerina who is in many ways more like me she gets up really early as well um, she's obsessed with reading so it's not just about playing on the Brilliant. iPad or whatever, which is phenomenal because again, I'm not an <coughs> academic. So like looking at her, I'm like, she's she's a better reader than I am and she's seven years old. Um, but she gets up early and we have this like time together where we're kind of like in each other's arms, like on the couch or wherever we are on holiday or wherever in like, you know, in the hotel room. But we've got this time together. I do the things that I need to do. She does her thing. And then we just focus on the rest of the day. And that, that just helps me be present. It's just whatever makes you feel like you've done what you need to do and you're 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 in that frame of mind where you've got that 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 peace, you know, that you can be present. Um and I and I fully agree with you. It's not about how how like the, the, the quantity, but the quality of the time. You know, and just being present and just like making people feel like they're the most impo- important person in the room. Yeah. yeah. That mm-hmm. applies to so much in life and in business now, I think. Just this obsession over quantity, um, more time, more likes, more views, whatever. But no, it's you, you get better results if you focus on the quality. Yeah, 100%. Like, I just look at these things and look, I'm, I'm going to give you this example and I'm not I'm not saying anything one way or the other. But let's just say you, you look back in history and, you, and you know, people that we, we admire that have that have changed the way that we all live our lives um, have made a massive impact on on like a, an immense amount of people around the world like the Mahatma Gandhi's of this world or the Mother Teresa's or whatever if if let's just say for the point of the example we found out and it was like you couldn't dispute it it was fact we found out that Mahatma Gandhi used to beat up his his wife for example mm-hmm. or Mother Teresa was grooming children like just giving you the extreme example right, okay. right? that's going to take the shine mm-hmm. off of the great work that they did that we put them on this pedestal and they had like you know so for me i think it's all good and well going out and building businesses and and doing all these things like having this instagram life and and look like of course i show what i want to fucking show mm-hmm. like of my life on instagram but for me you could be the most successful person have loads of money have loads of followers have loads of all these amazing things in your life if you're a fucking shit husband or a shit dad and don't get me wrong i appreciate that there's couples out there that are better off splitting and you know i'm not going to get into the intricacies but you're not you're not living up to your responsibilities as a dad i'm sorry but like all of that other stuff Mm -hmm. goes out the window for me that's just me and i'm not saying that i'm right i'm just saying that's for me like for me like you've got to do be the best version of yourself for the people around you that you love and care about. I want to give them the best lifestyle and, and the you know the, the the life and opportunities and experiences that they deserve. Like all of that goes away if you're over here all the time. Yeah. You know, I, I know people that and, and again, I, like I'm fucking this names, but I'm not going to people that, for want of a better way of putting it, they treat strangers like family and family like strangers. Uh-huh. And look, this is in the context of you haven't got a bad family that abuses you. I'm talking like, you know, the starting point is you've got a great family that loves you and supports you and wants you to do great, right? People have got that, but but abuse that and focus on other people mm-hmm. because that's where they feel they need to get their, their value from. It's in a high turnover, not profit. It's in loads of followers, you know, and, and the Instagram life, but it's not the people in their fucking life that they're spending time with. Like, that doesn't make sense for me. Even in business, is it? How, how many customers get neglected because their supply is just focused on getting new customers? Yeah. We've all been guilty of that. And it's something that I'm, I'm so focused on. Like, like, have you done everything possible for your existing clients rather than running around trying to get new clients? Mm-hmm. I did this video uh, early days, like 2015, uh, put it on Facebook. It was a, a short video um, 
we were on a family holiday, extended family holiday outside, uh, we were in Paris, outside the Louvre Museum. And I, and I just felt a, like compelled to just shoot a quick video, which was, there's a reason why smart museums around the world, like they charge you to go in, and then you go through the path that they want you to go through, and then you come out, you have to come out through the, the, the gift shop, shop, right? There's a reason for that. Don't get pissed off, understand that there's, you know, of course there's one commercial aspect to it. The flip side to that is, for you and I, you know, at this time of the day, if we wanted to, we could book a, a Eurostar to, to um, in four hours from now uh, in King's Cross and take us to Paris. And tonight we could be outside the Louvre Museum if we wanted. We could do the same tomorrow and next week and next month. What about the person that's coming from China to Europe that goes to Paris that is never going to likely come back to, to Europe? It's a once in a lifetime. They want the next best thing of going through the museum and and seeing the Mona Lisa, they want some memorabilia, right? And so the video was around like, what other services, what other benefits do you offer in your business or could you offer in your business that your clients don't know about that would be massively beneficial to them? And so um, I got this comment from um, a hairdresser um, who said, fuck me, I can't believe you've just done this video and what I've experienced this week. For 18 years, he had this lady, this customer come back every single month and get her hair done for 18 years. And she lived up the road from where his hairdresser was. And then every month she would leave his hairdressers, which is like two minutes away from where she lives, drive 30 to 45 minutes to this place, which funny enough is near where I live, um, to buy a specific conditioner. And then 30 to 45 minutes back, 18 years, wow. she never knew he fucking sold wow. it. He never mentioned that he fucking sold it. So not only would he have saved her an hour and a half mm -hmm. every month times 18 fucking mm -hmm. years. Um, but it would have been like the extra thing that he could have helped yeah. the, her with and like more money for his business, but just like building that that loyalty that, you know, and also the customer service experience or whatever. And it's just like, we focus on how do mm -hmm. we get, which is ironic because a lot of people come to you to get new business, you know, with the, the great work that you do here um, with the Cobra crew. But at the same time, are you giving everything to your existing clients, yeah. do they know everything that you yeah. do? Are you looking after the people that have, are looking after you as well? Let's be honest. Yeah, you as well. Let's yeah. be honest. Yeah, we call it the leaky bucket syndrome. Don't throw money on getting new clients if all the existing clients just drop them out of the bottom. Yeah. Okay, well, George, I tell you, talk to you all day. What minor knowledge? But um, I mean, gonna fire a couple of quick fire questions at you. Go for it. But before that, what is the best place for business owners to find out more about you? The easiest place is if you're on Instagram, George dot Cashflow. Excellent. Get that George dot cash flow on Instagram. Brilliant. Right. Two quick fire questions for you, George. Go for it. What's your favourite film and why? Oh, my favourite film is The Godfather Part One. Controversial. Okay. Yeah. Um, because there's so many elements of um, business, of family, of loyalty, of relationships. Like I took so many lessons through different phases of my life through that film. Excellent. Joe and I spend a lot of time arguing about which sequels are better than the originals. And one of mine, uh, two of mine are Godfather Part Two and Aliens over Alien, which Joel disagrees mm -hmm. with, but no, I oh, <laughs> love The Godfather. I think Marlon Brando was younger than me when he did The Godfather, which is quite depressing. Imagine that. Yeah, yeah. I think he's about 48, 49. Oh, wow. Just, yeah, yeah, bad. Uh, right, brilliant, love The Godfather. Next one, best mistake you've ever made? Best mistake I've ever made? Best mistake I've ever made um, from a business uh, context, I got a referral from an uncle um, and I was 18 hours into helping this person um, deal with their debt. So we're going way back to the insolvency days. Deal with their debt. And um, whilst I mentioned the fee price, I didn't take any payment and we're 18 hours into the service, like well over, like against a lot of the advice that I've shared today, um, well over how much time you spend mm -hmm. with, with a client. As soon as I mentioned money, like all hell broke loose and she went mad. I can't believe it, you know, I'm like just all this crazy stuff. And it just taught me a lesson, which is before you do anything, just make sure that everyone's on the same page. The other side know what they're getting and what they're investing. You know what you're getting and what you're investing. Um, and, and it just makes business a lot clearer and a lot cleaner for everyone. Wow, what a powerful way to end this podcast. George, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for your time. Thank you, appreciate you. You've been listening to the Stay Hungry podcast. Don't forget to subscribe, share, leave us a review. I'll love you forever. Visit andyandjoel.com if you want to know more about our coaching. We'd love to hear from you. Take care, everyone.